So today we talk about uh, particular uh, NMR particular nuclei. And uh, these are the topics that uh, we will cover. We will first of all introduce the uh, quadrupolar interaction. Uh, then we will uh, look at the Hamiltonian for uh, quadrupolar nuclei. Uh, we will uh, look at higher order terms. Oh, sorry for the spelling. Uh, then we will uh, look at the effect of uh, the uh, sample rotation of the quadrupolar interaction. And then we will look at methods that we can use to get uh, high resolution for quadrupolar nuclei. So uh, methods which are the based on a different type of uh, mechanical manipulation of the sample, which are the uh, DAS and DR, and then we have uh, some bound sequences. MMAS and STMAS. It will become uh, clear soon what they're uh, all about. So first of all, let's uh, look at the periodic table to figure out why it is important to talk about particular nuclei. Well, if you look at the periodic table and you just focus your attention on the nuclei which are just in one half, those are the uh, bright yellow one. And as you see, there are quite a few, but not that many. Uh, if you look at nuclei for which we have both a spin one half and a spin larger than half, there is just a handful of them, remarkably uh, proton and nitrogen are among these. But the vast majority of nuclei in the periodic table uh, are just available as quadrupolar nuclei. So um, if you want to look at nuclei throughout the vast majority of the periodic table, you have to know how to deal with quadrupolar nuclei. Otherwise, you won't be able to get any information through NMR. Oh, and by the way, the uh, white ones are those which are not exhibiting any spin at all. Uh, one website that I find really useful to get very quickly information on different types of uh, quadrupolar species is this one here that I provided uh, online, the Pascal map page. Uh, you have an interactive periodic table where you can uh, click on uh, various nuclei and get relevant information about these, as well as uh, references to uh, recent literature. So if you're starting to work on a quadrupolar species you don't know, uh, this is maybe a good way to start before you uh, expand your literature search uh, very significantly. Now, uh, let's look at the classical origin of the quadrupolar interaction. Now, uh, the energy of interaction between a uh, charge and a voltage is given by the product between the charge and the, uh, the potential B. Now, uh, this can also be uh, expanded in this format. So instead of the charge, we put in the uh, charge density, and then we have an integral over the position. So, rho times dr is equivalent to the mentally charge in a particular point of space, and then we integrate and we get the total charge. The reason why this is convenient is that actually the uh, pot electric potential here can also be space dependent. And so this is the uh, most correct and explicit way to deal with this uh, interaction. Now, uh, since this uh, potential term can have a quite complicated space dependency. It's uh, very convenient to uh, replace this with a uh, Taylor expansion around the um, central position that we uh, call zero. And then in this expansion, we have, first of all, the uh, potential at point zero. Then we have the derivative of the potential, partial derivative of the potential with respect to the uh, Cartesian coordinates all evaluated at r equal to zero times the uh, coordinate itself. And then we have this term which contains the uh, second derivatives and it's multiplied by uh, two uh, spatial coordinates. So in uh, this um, expression here, xj can be basically uh, x, y, z. Now, uh, in this equation here, this term, this term, and this term are nothing else than the potential at point zero, the electric field calculated at point zero, and the electric field gradient calculated at point r equal zero. And so uh, they are nothing else than numbers. If you take an expression and then you evaluate it at a particular point of space, you basically get a number. So these are just the uh, coefficients of this expansion. 
while x, j, x, k, etc. are the uh, coordinates. Now, why is this important? Well, if we uh, substitute in the expression for the energy this uh, series expansion for the, the potential, we can then gather up together various terms. So we have a rho times V of R, which has been replaced by the um, series expansion of V in the R. So this times that is this term here. And this is nothing else than a constant, because Q is the total charge, and V of 0 is a number. So uh, this number may even be quite large, but it's just a constant. And since we are only interested to uh, monitor transition between levels, so we are just interested, interested to look at the uh, energy differences, so actually this term does not contribute at all, and we can forget about it. This term here has to do with the, um, a so-called electric dipole, because we have a charge times a, a space coordinate, so it's a dipole. Actually, if we uh, look at the uh, nucleus, all the nuclei are known to have a, a symmetric charge distribution. They don't have any uh, dipole moment. So this term in a nucleus is zero. If you will not use this expansion for a nucleus, it may be not zero, but for a nucleus it's zero. So since you're interested in NMR, we can forget also about this term. The next term in the expansion that we have to think of is this one here. Now, uh, this coefficient here, we said is the electric field gradient. This coefficient here is instead the so-called electric quadrupole moment. So if your nucleus has a quadrupole moment, this term will be different from zero, and you can have contributions here. OK? Now, uh, it is known that all the nuclei which have a spin half, they are not only symmetric, but they also have a spherical charge distribution. So all these higher order terms in the expansion are zero, and we don't have to think about them. But if a nucleus has a spin larger than one half, so one, three half, and so on, then the charge in the nucleus will still be symmetrical, but will not be spherical. So you can have a quadrupole moment, and in that case, you can have a quadrupolar interaction term to consider in your Hamiltonian. OK? So it's two different things. All nuclei are symmetrical, so there is no electric dipole, but the charge doesn't have to be spherical, so you can have a quadrupole moment. And this only applies if uh, the spin is larger than one half. If something is not clear, just interrupt. Now, this is the classical way to look at things. Let's go back to quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, the quadrupolar interaction is expressed as follows. And uh, over here, I made a list of uh, what the various symbols are. I is a small i, like that is the spin quantum number. Actually, this capital I here is the angular uh, momentum operator for uh, the spin with uh, quantum number i. Sorry, I didn't put any facts on the operators, they're just assumed to be there. EQ is the electric quadrupole moment. V over here is actually a tensor now, and this is the electric field gradient tensor. Uh, this term here is the z component of the EFG tensor taken in the principal axis frame. And that is uh, normally taken as a measure of the magnitude of the uh, electric field gradient. And in some places, you will find that this term here is indicated as EQ. Uh, the other thing that you have to know about this uh, tensor, which represents the quadrupolar interaction, is that the sum of the uh, components along the diagonal, or the trace, is actually zero. And this is very important, because if you're dealing with the uh, NMR in the liquid state, you will see that the quadrupolar interaction will not uh, give you any shift in the in positions. So it will not affect your energy levels 
and you cannot really have any evidence of uh, the presence of the quadrupolar interaction just looking at the spectrum by itself. The quadrupolar interaction can still be important because it might affect your relaxation behavior, but it will not shift your peaks in a liquid sample, just because the isotropic part of the uh, tensor is uh, zero. Um, for some applications, it's uh, quite useful to work in the uh, principal axis frame of this interaction, and uh, if you do that, the Hamiltonian is written in this format. And there is a, a wide, wide range of uh, different notations that we find on how to describe the quadrupolar interaction. And uh, I have a list of references at the end of the presentation. And the first four are actually quite useful just to introduce the interaction the various possible notations to describe it. Uh, some of them are summarized here. So I try to uh, gather up uh, notations from here and there to see what you actually may encounter in the literature to represent the same quantity. So some people use the symbol chi, some people use the symbol CQ, and it's related that way to the uh, capital Q parameter that I introduced earlier. Uh, some people introduce uh, uh, omega Q in the principal axis frame to measure the uh, frequency of uh, the quadrupolar interaction. And this is actually what it is. It's related to chi in uh, this format. The asymmetry as the usual definition, so another thing is surprising there. Some people also introduce another symbol, PQ, which is related to the other constants like that. I don't think you should make any effort whatsoever to remember any of this. I think that uh, you should just take one form of the quadrupolar Newtonian be self-consistent and just work way, way through. But of course, if you're working with quadrupolar nuclei and you look up many articles, it's nice to have a bit of translation of what the various symbols may mean. And sometimes it's not fully consistent either. So just beware. Now, uh, I gave you in the previous page this definition for the quadrupolar interaction that was written in the uh, principal axis frame which is indicated PAS, sometimes just P. Uh, this same expression can be written also in an arbitrary frame using this uh, format, where you take the um, scalar product between the uh, spatial and spin tensors. Over here, I'm not assuming yet any high field truncation, so I'll keep in all the terms. So we have a sum for k that goes from minus 2 to 2 of these terms here. Notice that we don't have any isotropic terms, so those don't need to be accounted for. We just work with the rank 2 tensors. And again, very often, this object there is summarized within uh, this uh, constant in front. But uh, you have many different notations, just beware. Now, uh, we said that this is a general form of the Hamiltonian. Uh, for uh, some applications, people actually want to uh, present the uh, spatial part of the quadrupolar interaction in its own principal axis frame. And if you do that, you can go from a, a lab frame, for instance, to the principal axis frame by uh, using the uh, Wigner rotations. You have already seen in uh, previous lectures, either with Ilya or with Marco, how that works. It's uh, quite easy to change frames using the uh, Euler angles relating the two frames and the Wigner matrices of the correct run. So that is the expression. And if you are in the principal axis frame for the uh, quadrupolar interaction, then not all the elements need to be considered because actually only the minus 2, 0, and plus 2 elements of the tensor will be non zero. Now, um, quite often, we work in the uh, high field approximation. So if we do an MR in high field, it's quite common that our total Hamiltonian is actually the sum of the sigma Hamiltonian plus the quadrupolar Hamiltonian. And uh, we've seen in the past that uh, when we do the high field approximation, we first go to a toggling frame, which is related to the uh, Zeeman Hamiltonian in this format. And then we have uh, 
by doing this transformation, a modulation of each terms dictated by the normal frequency. Is everybody happy with that? Just tell me if it's not clear. Now we are just going through things that we have seen in uh, previous lectures. Apply to the quadrupolar Hamiltonian, obviously. So, um, if you want to look at the uh, high um, field truncation of the Hamiltonian, we can uh, expect that the Hamiltonian will be uh, the sum of various terms. And to first order, we will just add the t to zero term. In the previous page, we had this. Omega q p. Okay, that was the expression. And now we just retain the terms for which k is equal to zero. That's usually what we do in high field approximation. So if we do that, minus one to the k is uh, one, and then we have a to zero, t to zero, and this term here is one. So I guess you see how it uh, comes up. to this format. Oh, and actually here also this should have a L. These two are in the same frame. And uh, now this is uh, in the lab frame. Uh, we can transform just this term and express it in the past in this format. Or we can include the contribution of this angular dependence that uh, relates the uh, past to the principal axis frame in the coefficient in front so that the omega q term contains the angular dependence here. That is uh, very common to do. Again, this is uh, notations that you will find. You can find a wide range of uh, ways to write the same thing. But the key message is that if you just take a Hamiltonian to first order, which is uh, plausible when the uh, quadrupolar interaction is much smaller than the Zeeman interaction, then you might be able to get away with just this term. I mean, this is not obviously true because sometimes the quadrupolar interaction is so large that uh, this approximation does not hold. But let's assume it holds for the time being and then see what happens when it doesn't work. Now, uh, we said that the Hamiltonian is this, and uh, the uh, rank 2 component 0 tensor is nothing else than 3xz squared minus i times i plus 1. Okay? So if we want to know uh, what type of effect the quadrupolar interaction has on our uh, frequencies, how it affects the spectrum, what we need to do is that we have to evaluate this term here. This term here is nothing else than the first order uh, correction to the energy according to perturbation theory. And so if we stop at the first order, that will do. So we take the uh, average Hamiltonian to first order, and we bracket it between uh, the spin states for uh, the spin that we consider. Now, if we do that, instead of uh, hq1, we have the operator 3iz squared minus this numerical factor, i times i plus 1. This is just a number. Now, when Iz operates on Im, what do we get? M, Im. If Iz operates on Im, this is equal to M, Im. Notice that I'm omitting h bar. I mean, h bar should in principle be there, but. Uh, we said a few lectures back that we omit h bar from the calculations. 
So this is what we get. So if we have iz squared operating on this, we will get n squared. Okay? And over there we have 3 iz squared, so it gives us 3 n squared, minus i i plus 1, which remains the same, that's just a number. And uh, these functions are uh, orthonormal, so when uh, we bracket it, they give us 1. And so uh, this is the result to first order perturbation theory. That will be our energy correction. And this is really important because it tells us that uh, when we evaluate the correction to the energy, that will only depend on the square of the n value. So it doesn't really matter if you're considering a level which is plus 1 or minus 1. If it is plus 1 half or minus 1 half, the energy correction is the same. Okay? Now, uh, what does this mean for an uh, integer spin? If we have an integer spin, say spin 1, if we have just a Zeeman interaction, we will have three spin levels. I didn't put the labels, but this could be typically minus 1, 0, plus 1. Okay? And we said that the correction will be the same for a, a spin which is the same absolute value of the uh, projection number. So this shift here and that shift there are the same in magnitude and in the same direction. The shift associated with the level in the center is actually going in a, a different direction. And as a result, if you have a spin 1, you will end up with a, a set of uh, levels like this, in which this transition here and that transition there are all quite far away in principle from the Lagrange frequency, and they are shifted by a quantity related to the uh, size of the quadrupolar interaction, which in principle can be quite large. So you can see immediately that in principle, if you have an integer spin, you may not have any signal easily observable close to your normal frequency because your signal may be well off. But it depends on how big is this quadrupolar interaction. Okay? And so, uh, what do we do? Uh, I apologize, this uh, picture is quite crowded. I probably should have uh, made two slides. I didn't have time. Uh, these are the two typical uh, spin one uh, uh, nuclei that people study. The first one is deuterium. For deuterium, the quadrupolar interaction is usually not very large. It can go up to 150, 180 kilo or something like that. It's often even uh, lower than that. So it's of the order of uh, hundreds of kilohertz compared to a uh, Zeeman interaction, which is many tens of megahertz. So usually with deuterium, the uh, first order quadrupolar Hamiltonian is actually quite a good approximation. And uh, for this system, uh, what we normally do to acquire the spectrum is that we <coughs> employ this sequence here. This is called a uh, uh, spin echo sequence. It's a uh, solid echo. We have two 90 degree pulses, not a 90, 180. And the pulses have a phase that differ by 90 degrees. If you use this echo echo, you will get refocusing of uh, the signal coming from a spin uh, one nucleus. And this uh, sequence is actually very important because one of the problems in detecting a decent signal on uh, deuterium, if you have a large quadrupolar interaction, could be that if you do the sequence in the usual way, like pulse detection, you can do something like this in simulation, but actually in reality, you always lose a little bit of time here due to that time. And this time here, might have a very large effect on uh, the type of spectrum you get and uh, modify your line shape. So over here, uh, you see a few um, examples of what you should get. This is a, a simulation in Simpson. Uh, this line in uh, red is the result of an accurate uh, Simpson simulation using a, a pulse and modern time. The one in green is a, a pulse and the dead time of uh, two microseconds. So you can see that you went from here to here. You had a massive effect on uh, how your spectrum looks like. If you do the experiment with one pulse observation, it will not look very good. If you do an uh, ideal pulse, 
not a real pulse, as this one, then you will get the pink line. So an ideal pulse in Simpson is a pulse which is infinitely intense and infinitely sharp. That, of course, is something that you cannot achieve on a spectrometer. But that tells you that the sharper your pulse, the better it is. And if you do a solid echo sequence, where you actually don't have the dead point problem, you get this line in blue, which is actually quite well-defined shape that you can easily fit with a suitable program. So the solid echo sequence goes around the dead time problem and gives you a signal that uh, resembles the one that you would get with the um, ideal pulse. It's not quite as intense, but it's still pretty good. And that uh, gives you a chance to uh, get uh, detailed and precise quadrupolar parameters. If you're dealing instead with the uh, nitrogen 14, uh, the quadrupolar interaction in uh, most solid samples ranges from uh, 1 megahertz up to 5 megahertz. So it's really significant. And uh, if you're working, for instance, on a machine which is a 9.4 Tesla, 400 megahertz, the Lambda frequency will be just above 28 megahertz. So you see, it's uh, not much larger than the uh, Lambda frequency. The quadrupolar interaction is quite massive compared to the Lambda frequency. And that is a problem. Uh, you will have a significant shift of the peaks from the uh, Lambda frequency according to the picture I gave you before, so again that makes it tough. But there are ways to work on uh, N14 using uh, indirect detection, overtone NMR. And actually, uh, a lot of people, well, a lot of people, there is some uh, use of uh, N14 NMR for uh, so-called NQR experiments, which are experiments in the uh, zero field, where you use the quadrupolar interaction to split your letters. And that is actually used, uh, for instance, to detect explosives. That's one of the applications, because many explosives are quite high in nitrogen. So uh, they exploit this type of uh, spectroscopy to scan uh, bugs and suspicious uh, things. Now, uh, if you have a half-integer quadrupolar spin, which is uh, the most common case, there is very, very few spins which are integer spins, actually. Then uh, let's look, for instance, at the energy level diagram for a spin 3 half. You have uh, four levels, let's say minus 3 half, minus 1 half, 1 half, 3 half. As we said before, the uh, levels are shifted by a quantity which depends on the absolute value of uh, n. So this level and this level will be shifted by the same quantity in the same direction. And we see that there is a central transition, indicated often CT which actually occurs exactly at the same frequency as the Lambda frequency. There is no dependency from the quadrupolar interaction on the central transition. If you instead look at the satellite transitions, they are both affected by the same quantity, again, but it leads to a satellite transition here, which is uh, much below the Lambda frequency, and the satellite transition here, which is much above the Lambda frequency. And so if your uh, quadrupolar interaction is uh, moderate and you can just get away with the uh, first order quadrupolar Hamiltonian, then it's relatively easy to work in this region here and just deal with the central transition. Uh, quite often, though, this is not the case. So we said that all this uh, nice story applies to first order. If your quadrupolar Hamiltonian is large, you will have also this term here, and possibly more. Actually, there is examples in which people have exploited properties of the third order average Hamiltonian. Now, uh, the second order average Hamiltonian is uh, related to the original Hamiltonian through uh, double commutators. And uh, when you take the uh, double commutators of the quadrupolar interaction, you end up with terms which are this form here. which don't look very pretty. So it's a lot of uh, complicated terms and so on. But if we are in a, a condition in which we work at a high field, we will just retain the part that actually has uh, the sum of the components equal to zero. 
So we will have uh, terms that we need to consider which have uh, 2k, 2 minus k, so k plus minus k is 0. And then we have uh, terms like that. Uh, all the other terms actually uh, vanish. They need to be considered. And uh, this can be uh, simplified as follows because this one is uh, not contributing in a high field as a set. We just take the, the component zero uh, terms. And this term here can be rearranged using uh, Klebsch Gordon coefficients. I don't know if you've uh, done those with uh, Malcolm or Ilya before. Klebsch Gordon? Okay, no. I will not get into that. Let's just say that these are clever coefficients which depend on uh, spin rank and spin component. I think we should have uh, a separate lecture on Klebsch Gordon if uh, you actually ever meet them. But I just what I want to tell you is that instead of having uh, these uh, terms here, which have a product of tensors, you can replace those in a, a linear combination of tensors with a suitable ranks and components. So instead of products of tensors, you get single tensors with suitable coefficients. And so you go from something like this to something like that, where you have just one term for space and one, one term for spin. There are rules of how this is done. You have not done it before. It will take too long to go through it, so we just go from here straight to here. Okay? and you forget about these lines, which are uh, incomprehensible at this stage. You can just take my word that this bit, these coefficients, are somehow related to these coefficients, and this commutator here is somehow related to this tensor term here. And what you need to know about this term here is that it has component 0, and has uh, odd values of uh, run. That's all you need to know about this. So we go from a situation in which we had a lot of terms with uh, lots of commutators to something else. And the uh, spin rank can have values 1 and 3. The space rank goes from 0 to 4. So just focus on this information here. And actually, uh, it can be shown, again, you don't need to know how, that the only terms in the uh, space rank that you have to consider are the even ones due to symmetry reasons. So instead of that ugly thing that we had before, we have uh, a bunch of uh, coefficients which have only even uh, space component ranks and odd spin component ranks. And as you see, there is a term which has j equals zero. So the fact that we have a, a j equals 0 means that there is something isotropic over here. So uh, when we do the uh, second order average Hamiltonian theory on the quadrupolar interaction, we end up with an uh, isotropic contribution, j0. And this is called the second order isotropic shift of the quadrupolar interaction. It's a, a term a0,0 which is related to uh, the key parameters in uh, this format. So it will depend on the size of the quadrupolar interaction, it will depend on the field, and it will depend on the spin and the symmetry. But it's just important to be aware that it exists. It's a bit counterintuitive because the last thing that you expect when you're going to higher orders is that you get back isotropic terms, but actually this is the case. So we have an isotropic term which will basically shift the peaks in a different way, depending on the size of the quadrupolar interaction and depending on which field you work on. So when you try to predict where your peaks are, and you just look at the isotropic shift for a peak, you actually may be quite a bit off. Because this shift depends in a quadratic way on the size of the quadrupolar interaction, so it can be quite significant. And it's important to be aware of it. Uh, the other take-home message is that we have also rank 2 and rank 4 uh, components. And uh, again, I don't go through the maths. If you're interested in the mathematics of how they look like, you can go and look them up in a book or a specialized article. 
But as a result of all these uh, higher order terms, basically we go from uh, this nice picture where our central transition was the same as the level of frequency to something a bit complicated where all the levels are affected by the quadrant polar interaction to some extent. Not as much as uh, before, so the central transition will still be relatively close to the Lerner frequency, but it will not be a nice sharp line, which does not depend on the quadrant polar interaction at all. Everybody happy with this so far? Now, the simulations need to be refined. I think I didn't spend uh, enough time to acquire enough points of uh, line broadening, etc. Et but this is a, a simulation for a uh, Rubidium uh, 87 uh, using the parameters that I took from uh, reference file. And I can put the uh, input files that I used for uh, this work on a uh, blackboard afterwards. I just need to check them. So, if you simulate this system, you get your spectrum, which is about, uh, I would say, 3 megahertz wide, which is not something you would normally excite with that pulse. So as you see, the quadrupolar interaction can give you something quite complicated and uh, broad. This uh, narrow bit in the middle, which goes so far up, is actually your central transition. And this stuff here, is dominated by the satellite. Just to get it in perspective. If we uh, focus our attention on the uh, central transition, it would look something like this. On a suitable scale with enough smoothing, I mean, the other intensities can be so small that one almost can forget about it. Uh, I just took a um, Ramonstein system in uh, Simpson, and in Simpson you can actually uh, decide what terms to include for your quadrupolar interaction. So you can tell to Simpson if you just want to include first order or if you also want to include second order. So if you uh, tell Simpson that you have a simulation down to first order, you get the uh, green one. If you put in the second order, you get that. So that is just to give you a feel for uh, what type of effect in terms of broadening the second order terms we have on the uh, spectrum. They are quite significant. Again, all of this uh, we will uh, provide afterwards through Blackboard if you want. Uh, the other thing that you have to keep in mind is uh, notation curves. Now, uh, notation curves will be very much affected by uh, how you work. So they will be depend not only on the size of uh, your quadrupolar uh, interaction, but they can also depend on the uh, spin quantum number. Now, uh, if you have a pulse which is uh, very soft, like this uh, red one here, or if you have a, a soft pulse, you have very different notation curves. And you see, when you have a, a very hard pulse, it goes like that. When it's soft, it goes like that. So uh, beware and uh, take into account that uh, depending on the range of uh, notation frequency you have, you may have a change of the notation frequency and you may have a trouble to evaluate it. Um, actually, I think there is a mistake on the side. I will uh, put the corrected uh, slide afterwards. Apologies. What I uh, provide here and information about uh, this and the iteration between the uh, size of the quadrupolar interaction and the notation frequency. And this is the number plotted. It's a, a very complicated plot, which just wants to point out for you that depending on the uh, region of the uh, notation frequency you are, you can get very different curves. So 
is like in kilohertz? No, it's not kilohertz. My label here is the ratio between that and that. Okay. So you take a spin system, you uh, take a notation frequency, you have a certain size of the quadrupolar interaction and take a ratio. Actually, this type of curve was taken uh, from uh, one of the references I have, I think it's reference number three, but I just read on the data and see some myself. And uh, I will also put the input for this online. So if you actually uh, want to make sure that you have uh, meaningful intensities, unless you know what's the size of your quadrupolar interaction, etc., etc., and if your signal is poor, it might be wise if you first calibrate the uh, power levels on a liquid and then you take a, a relatively short pulse. Because otherwise you might be expecting to have a 90 degree and you end up with a 180. You can see that your rotation frequency seems to uh, go a lot faster than you expect when you have a quadrupolar nuclei because of uh, this equation here. You see? That would be the notation frequency as you normally know it, but you can have this additional factor which has to do with the spin. And so you end up with an effective uh, notation frequency which is actually different from uh, what you would have calculated on an isotropic solution where the quadrupolar interaction vanishes. And the isotropic solution is the good standard to use the uh, parameters which are safe for the problem. So for instance, if you calibrate the power level to, I don't know, 100 kilohertz on the liquid, and then you put in your uh, solid with a large quadrupolar interaction, you may find that your 90 degree pulse is not 0.5 microsecond, but uh, 1.2. That's okay, you're not actually putting in 200 kilohertz in the spectrometer. This is just an effect of the quadrupolar interaction, flipping up the notation of the uh, spins a lot faster. Are you all with me with that? Do you understand what I say? So when you have a soft pulse, you can have an oscillation which is uh, quite long and is the same both on the liquid and on the solid. If you have a, a hard pulse, if uh, this is your liquid, the solid would actually probably go like that. Much faster. So for soft paths, which are a slow oscillation, the notations actually match. For hard paths, the notations don't match and the oscillation is a lot faster on the solid. So if you have a spin three half, say, you would uh, half the mutation frequency. If you have a spin five half. If you have a spin three half, three half plus one half is two. So you would uh, get that your uh, pulse is going twice as fast. If you have a spin five half, then it could be a factor of uh, three in apparent speed of oscillation. So you might get something like uh, less than one. Uh, now, we want to consider magic angle spinning, okay? So, uh, well, we dealt with magic angle spinning before. Let's write again the Hamiltonians. We have HQ1, HQ2. We have the usual uh, prefactor in front. Then we had the uh, tensor we had before, and we just added the uh, modulation of the spatial part with the, the corresponding with the matrices. So for the uh, rank 2 part of the uh, tensor, we have the two M0 terms. And also here, we have a modulation of rank 0, 2, and 4, and correspondingly D of J and 0. So also here we have modulation of the uh, spatial part with weaker matrices, but with a mixture of orders. I just took the Hamiltonian as I had before. And the logic angle notation is just accounted by transforming the spatial coefficients with the corresponding linear matrices of the right order. Now, if we are at the magic angle, 
we know that rank two terms with the n equals zero component will vanish. Okay? On top of that, uh, if we take the uh, average of the Hamiltonian, we will also get rid of uh, the other terms, which have n different from zero. So if we get both conditions into account, over here and over here, we get that and that, and then d2, 0, the 0, 0, 2, it r. If you had the magic angle, that would go to 0. Here we would have uh, just the 0, 0 terms, because we are getting rid of the uh, time dependence. But of this, only the one with j equals 2 would disappear, if you had the magic angle. So we have two approximations. First of all, we get rid of all the terms which are time dependent, so we just retain the m equals zero terms, both here and there. And then we have on top the magic angle spinning, which will uh, get rid of some of these terms, but not all. Now, if we actually decide to spin at the magic angle, this is the form of the second order Legendre polynomial. And we know that the zero crossing is at uh, 54.7 uh, blah 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 degrees. So if you are at the magic angle, we can get rid of the uh, rank 2 terms quite easily. But we cannot get rid of the rank 4 terms, which is this curve here. Because the fourth order Legendre polynomial has the zero crossings in a completely different position. And the zero crossing for the fourth order Legendre polynomial are here at uh, um, 30.5 and 70.12. So when we choose which angle we want to spin at, we cannot get rid of uh, all the anisotropies for quadrupolar nuclei. That's as simple as that. So if we take again a simulation and we look at uh, the effect of the quadrupolar Victorian up to second order, and we take a static spectrum, and then we take the same spectrum under magic angle spinning. This is what we get. It's a significant reduction in line shape due to magic angle spinning, but it's far from being an isotropic line. The line has a certain degree of anisotropy, and this anisotropy is due to the uh, rank four terms in the angular part of the quadrupolar electronium. And those cannot be eliminated by uh, magic angle spinning. Okay? Now, um, we said that the magic angle spinning alone cannot uh, give us high resolution spectra. So if you have the magic angle, we get rid of all the rank 2 tensors. And that's what people normally choose to do. Because not only you get rid of the rank 2 tensors, which have to do with the quadrupolar Hamiltonian, but also for all the other. Um, anisotropic interactions. I mean, you could have a CSA, you could have dipole dipole coupling. If you place yourself at the magic angle, also those will be gone to some extent. So it's very convenient to actually use the magic angle. On the other hand, uh, the rank for terms vanish at a different angle, and so if you choose the magic angle, they will remain. And so if you want to get rid of those, you have to use a different approach. And there are approaches which are based on the uh, special mechanical rotation, which are DOR, or double rotation, and DAS, dynamic angle spinning. Or you can use pulse sequences like M2 mass and ST mass. Uh, I will update the handout notes uh, afterwards, because there are a few slides which are not too clear. I need a bit more explanation, but uh, for the time being, just try to manage with what we have for a discussion. So, uh, let's go back to uh, the mechanical methods to get high resolution. Uh, DOR is the first one. How you do it is to basically have two rotors, one inside the other. One rotor rotates at the magic angle, one rotates at another degree, which is either 30.5 or 17 point uh, whatever, to get up the second tangent polynomial. And by doing that, you basically can average out both first and second order quadrupolar interactions. And so if you uh, look at the results of uh, 
that you get by DOI. If you start static and then you start uh, rotating gradually, you can see that uh, you get some uh, pretty well resolved spectra with uh, lots of spinning sidebands. Uh, these experiments here were uh, done on uh, sodium-23, on a, a sodium oxalate, where the speed for the inner rotor was uh, of the order of uh, kilohertz, like 4 kilohertz, while the uh, second rotor was uh, the one spinning uh, slower. And uh, this is referring to the speed of the inner rotor. Uh, you have a lot of spinning sidebands, but you can see that you have a very decent resolution. And so your signal to noise benefits significantly by doing DOR. And there are also uh, more recent uh, methods in which you can actually also take care of uh, suppressing some of these spinning sidebands. So if you have a sample which is made up of uh, multiple sides, you don't get all these spinning sidebands overlapping with your other sides and creating a, a difficulty in understanding how many sides you have. So there are ways to take care of the spinning sidebands. But definitely DOR uh, leads you to uh, very good uh, resolution. But this implies that you need to have a specialized probe. And it's also usually quite tricky to get the two rotors to spin nicely. So it takes a little bit of time also to set up. Uh, another method that can be used, again, requires a specialized probe. And in this case, uh, we have experiments in which uh, uh, we have a single rotor, but the rotor can be spun at two different angles, beta 1 and beta 2. And actually, if you uh, record that to the experiment, it has been shown that uh, uh, you can get um, high resolution by uh, correlating the uh, single quantum satellite transitions between the direct and indirect dimension in a special way and to choose the angles of rotation for the direct and indirect dimension wisely. So if one goes through all the maths and chooses the angles of rotation for the direct and indirect dimension, one can figure out that there is a combination of terms that can guarantee that uh, certain terms go to zero. So you just have to uh, solve these two simultaneous equations and find the angles for which this works. Now, there is many, many different angles that can be used for uh, double axis spinning. But uh, actually, there is no angle in the range between 39 and 63 degrees. So you can find solutions which uh, actually uh, give you something decent and get rid of uh, your quadrupolar terms. But you cannot do it at the magic angle ever. There is no solution there. So you may be able to get rid of uh, the quadrupolar term, but actually you will have all the other anisotropies to disturb you when you do the experiments. But the reason why DAS is uh, so important is that it provided the idea to develop NQMAS. So uh, people thought, well, instead of correlating single quantum transitions using different angles in uh, two dimensions, I can use the fact that I have two dimensions and we can correlate different type of uh, multiple quantum transitions. So uh, people designed, uh, actually Lucio Friedman designed an experiment in which he has a period of evolution here in which it generates multiple quantum transitions. In this example here uh, we have a, a multiple quantum order of three. Then this is evolving during time t1 and then it's converted back to single quantum coherence we have a time t2, and then we acquire the signal. And actually, uh, by relating t2 and t1 time intervals in a, a special way, it's possible to get rid of uh, the rank 4 components. How is this done? Well, people looked at the expression for the transition probability from minus m to m, the transition frequency. And uh, this is uh, related to a bunch of suitable coefficients. These coefficients are known. You have also a similar expression for the central transition. And actually, it can be found that the uh, rank four terms are cancelled out if the uh, time evolution in the time t2 and t1 are related by this proportionality constant where the proportionality constant takes the uh, coefficient 
I'm for a given uh, quantum order M and divides it by the coefficient C4 for the same spin I but related to the uh, M equal to one half. So this, for instance, could be three half and one half here. So as long as your time intervals are related by this equation, you can get rid of a uh, rank for terms. If you go through the maths, you will find that this is a solution. Now, most people don't go through the maths. There are tables of what type of proportionality constants you need to use, and you just look them up and use them when you set up your experiments. And then what you get is something like follows. Uh, you get your uh, data set, which uh, looks uh, something like that. Uh, if you do the Fourier transform along the uh, two dimension, you get something like this. And you see that your uh, uh, spectra, as you go along the indirect dimension, have some type of a progressive tilt. Uh, this can be corrected by doing a, a phase correction, which is time dependent. So you apply a different phase factor to each individual slice according to a certain equation which depends on the size of the coefficients. And then you get a, a spectrum of this type in which the uh, second dimension now looks tidier. And then you can just do a Fourier transform in the other dimension and you get your spectrum. Uh, this thing is called shearing. You can do it all in one go and apply this step here which is called the shearing transformation. And uh, most of the modern spectrometers have this already implemented, so you just say what type of uh, spin you have, what type of multiple quantum order you have, and the tables of uh, what type of uh, phase correction needs to be applied are already there, and it will do it for you. But that's where it comes from. So you have to apply basically a phase correction to the data in the second dimension, which is related to the coefficients that you used for the data position. And then you get your uh, spectrum. Now, uh, why people want to do MQ mass? Well, they want to do it because of the high resolution. But there are some problems. So first of all, the efficiency is quite low in general. And uh, if you have a spin uh, 3 half, you can just do MQ mass of uh, order 3. But if you have a spin uh, 5 half, 7 half, 9 half, etc., you have a choice of what type of uh, multiple quantum order you want to excite. You could uh, go for 3q mass, 5q mass, 7q mass, etc., etc. But as you go up in multiple quantum order, usually your resolution becomes better, but your efficiency goes severely down. So it's a compromise on uh, what you can afford. Uh, the efficiency of these methods depends very, very strongly on the uh, actual strength of the pulse. So whenever you optimize an MQ mass sequence, try to use the uh, strongest pulse that is compatible with the probe. So for instance, if you are on a 4 mm probe and you're using a relatively high gamma uh, quadrupolar nucleus, calibrate your power on the liquid to close to 100 kHz from liquid, and then you put in your solid. And you will find that that gives you an apparent mutation frequency, which is well over 100, but that's OK. It will not be actually much above 100, but that's the highest power you can use on the probe. And that will give you the best efficiency for the current conditions you have. Uh, there is a lot of reports of people doing uh, MQ mass experiments, which are uh, absolutely fantastic, or microcoils, which can give enormous RF powers. And then the efficiency is uh, much, much higher than anything you can do on uh, commercial uh, solenoid coils. So just be aware, uh, RF power is extremely important. Uh, the original MQ mass paper is just made up of uh, two pulses, and that is affected by uh, some uh, phase problem, as often the uh, lines don't ca actually come out of speed absorption. So uh, the basic sequence has been modified in the following years, and uh, I think that uh, most people uh, now use a modified version of the original sequence. Now, there is many variations. I will not go through them. I will just uh, present you some of the popular ones. For instance, uh, this one is a, a split one whole echo uh, sequence. Over here, we have the uh, usual MQ bus excitation as before, with two pulses. And over here, we have a, a selective 
particles on the central transition. When we do the experiment this way, with a split T1, uh, we break up our T1 between here and here, and then at some point here, we will get a full echo of uh, the signal. We need to choose the uh, duration over here in order to ensure that we can record a full echo. So uh, this method is actually quite uh, nice because uh, if you do the maths, you will see that it actually does not require any shearing. If you record the uh, echo exactly this way, there are variations of the uh, echo experiment in which you use uh, uh, selective pipe tasks, but in which shearing is still uh, needed. The only Sorry, which one is the expensive to do? Which one is the expensive to do? In this experiment here? No, is this one or uh, trying um, with adding with shearing? No, this does not require shearing. Yeah, I understand. Uh, which one is expensive? Doing this experiment or trying uh, or doing the one with shearing? To be honest, uh, if you know how to do the shearing, it's not a big problem to do the shearing. It depends on uh, the software you use. I mean, uh, sometimes it's. Uh, if you use old software, uh, you don't know what type of uh, parameters you have. If you do this, you don't actually have to look up any tables. The experiment just comes up uh, mm -hmm. straight OK. But uh, it's not a problem to do any shading transformation. Mm -hmm. It's just easier to look at the data sometimes when you don't have to apply a shading transformation. It's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, as I said, there are variants of this that require or don't require sharing. It's not a big deal to do the sharing transformation. You have equations on how the phase should be changed, so it's no big deal. Also here, actually, we like to look at tables because over here we have coefficients A and B that depend on the spin you have and on the multiple quantum order you have. So again, you have to look up what these numbers are. But a result of this, you get a, a quite neat experiment. Uh, the drawback on uh, this type of method is that uh, since your uh, echo may come uh, quite a bit late and you want to often acquire full echo, if the T2 of your sample is intrinsically short, it may not be very efficient. So it doesn't work well on every sample. It depends a little bit on the sample you have. Uh, you have an experiment uh, here, in which instead of uh, a selective uh, uh, pi pulse, you have a selective 90 degree pulse. On the Z-filtered experiment, after you generate triple quantum coherence, you convert it back and you send it back to zero quantum. The two pathways are uh, equally populated and you get uh, your spectrum. Over here, you actually don't acquire the full echo, you acquire it more or less straight away. And, uh, this experiment also works fine if you have a very short T2s. You need to apply sharing, but it's just uh, to be aware of what your opportunities are. Uh, these are the type of experiments that you can do with the uh, NQMAS. For instance, this is uh, one of uh, the model samples that everybody likes. It's a uh, rubidium uh, nitrate. If you're testing an NQMAS pulse sequence and you want to make sure that it works, if you test it on something like that, you can plan with it, uh, on it. so you can uh, check that actually you're doing things correctly. Uh, over here is the direct dimension. This is the indirect dimension. You can look at the uh, projections on the direct and indirect side, and you can see that uh, if you look at projections on this axis, you get lines which are uh, relatively sharp. And so instead of getting this, uh, this thing here, you can actually resolve that you have three sides on this material, three unequivalent sites. And a lot of people use MQMAS to study materials like uh, alcos and uh, so on, or uh, glasses, all sorts of things. Oxygen-17 NMR is also very popular. You can apply this principle to a lot of things. Uh, as I said, one of the problems that we have is often the efficiency. Over here is just a sketch of uh, some of the sequences that you may possibly want to use to enhance your signal. There is actually a forest of them, so depending on what is your spin, what is the multiple quantum order you want to uh, excite, what is the size of the quadruple interaction you are dealing with, you may want to choose a different method. All these methods here uh, work for this type of uh, transitions, but uh, 
as I said, once you know which nucleus you want to look at, read the relevant literature, find the right sequence, and then proceed from there. Actually, the signal enhancement that you can get can be uh, quite significant. Using the sequences presented above, if you uh, look at the uh, basic uh, empty mass experiment, you would have this first line here. And then depending on the uh, sequence you apply to enhance your signal, you can go from uh, that all the way down to this where the signal has increased by quite a significant factor. So you see, you may have a sequence which is a lot more complicated, but that may be beneficial because you end up with a much stronger signal. Again, read all the fine prints and details because some of these sequences do enhance your signal, but they also distort your line shape. So when you go and analyze your data, you either analyze your data uh, with quite great care, putting in all the details of the past sequence, or you might end up with a line shape which is severely distorted and maybe you have trouble to extract the color for an interaction if you're interested. Uh, there is other methods around which are called uh, um, STMAS, satellite transition magic angle spinning. This is a, a quite strong alternative to MQMAS. Uh, while MQMAS exploits uh, multiple quantum transitions, STMAS actually uh, works uh, on the uh, satellite and uh, it's very tricky to set up. It can be very tricky to set up. I mean, there are compensated versions of this, but it can be tricky to set up. It requires usually a uh, quite decent adjustment of the magic angle, but it's uh, much more efficient than MQMAS. Uh, since it uh, uses single quantum rather than uh, multiple quantum transitions, the resolution in the second dimension is not as good as MQMAS. So again, look at your sample, see how many sites you have. If you have uh, many, many sites and you need uh, to be able to resolve them, maybe you will have to take more scans and go the MQMAS pathway. If you don't have many sites and you just want to have a 2 d high resolution, or if your sites are well distinguished, maybe this is a good alternative. But again, be careful how you adjust the uh, magic angle. And also here, if you look in the literature, there is a, a range of uh, variations of the basic sequence. I don't go through the detail. I think that if you're interested, you should uh, look it up. Uh, just a word of warning. So when you work on quadrupolar nuclei, we have first and second order quadrupolar interaction. So depending on the size of the Hamiltonian, you can decide if uh, higher order terms are a problem. And you can also decide if uh, direct acquisition might be an option. If the quadrupolar interaction is uh, not too large, you might actually get some uh, decent uh, data with uh, just one pulse observation. If the second order broadening is significant, then you might have uh, problems with that. But uh, the conditions will always suit the sample you have. And then for samples which have exceedingly large quadrupolar interaction, magic angle spinning will may not benefit you at all. It could be that it's so large that you just don't excite much of it. So some people uh, just do experiment by changing the carrier frequency and working static to see all the spectrum. So also that is an option. If your quadrupolar interaction is really enormous, you may just uh, be better off by running static and acquiring many spectra at different offsets and combining them cleverly. So try to get an idea of uh, the size of the polar interaction you have. I think much of this is available online. And then there is just a lot of references. So you can uh, go through some of the references and then uh, we'll be able to the slides. And yeah, that's it. <coughs>